and the deeper your bullet penetrates, the less likely it is to cause incapacitation. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't to me. And all this is quite difficult to accept when you realize that the major vessels in a body are all deep inside, and that many people have several inches of fat which must be penetrated, not to mention the problems of angled shots which require even more penetration to be effective. Now let's have a look at one bullet which had been one of the highest rated bullets in the original RII study, the Glazer Safety Slug. Dr. Fackler is shooting a 357 Magnum Glazer Safety Slug into specially formulated ballistic gelatin which accurately replicates a bullet's performance in muscle tissue. Watch the result. Well, the safety slug created a large temporary cavity and thereby earns its high score in the RII study, notice the very shallow penetration, about 10 centimeters or 4 inches or so. What you see here is quite typical of this bullet's performance. I have here an x-ray which will further validate the test you just saw. What you're seeing is the buttock of a man who had been shot with a 357 Magnum safety slug from about 10 feet. If this criminal had been shot with a good, heavy, penetrating bullet, he very likely would have had a fractured or damaged pelvis instead of a simple, torn-up, non-critical buttock. Notice that the pellet penetration is no more than four to five inches, exactly what we'd see in the gelatin test. Not enough penetration to do significant damage in most parts of the body. Well, it depends on where you hit him. If you hit him in the heart, surely. If you hit him in the, in the brain, surely. If you hit him in the abdomen, Probably not, because the big vessels are, are probably at least 15 centimeters deep in, 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 in a f direct frontal shot. And, in, and of course, any kind of an angle will increase this depth of, penetra of uh, distance from the skin. And the guy has his arm in front of the uh, body or something. The, the glazer safety slug won't even get into the abdomen if it, if it has to go through an arm first. Now compare the performance of one of the lowest rated bullets in the RII study, the 45 caliber 230 grain full metal jacket or ball round. Here we have a penetration of over 29 inches, certainly enough to penetrate through an arm and the body from any angle, and perhaps too much penetration, but that's something we'll discuss later. Let's take a look at a few other rounds. This is a very hot 38 caliber, 110 grain hollow point round which has been issued to the Secret Service. Note that we have a penetration of 21 centimeters or about 8.4 inches, certainly less than adequate. Now what do you think we'll get with a heavier 38 caliber hollow point bullet? 158 grains and at a lower velocity, 840 feet per second. Do you think the penetration will be more or less? Think about it. Let's find out. We get a penetration of 36 centimeters, about 14 and a half inches. That's an increase in penetration of some 40%. Now we reduce the bullet's velocity by about 25% and increase the weight by about 40%, and we still got an increase in penetration of about 40%. Does that tell you anything about the relationship between bullet weight and penetration and velocity? Well, good for you if you realize that penetration is more a function of bullet weight than velocity. Heavier bullets will penetrate further than light bullets. This is true of bullets of the same type and design. You can expect that heavy full metal jacketed or solid lead bullets will penetrate further than a lighter version of the same bullet. But you can't compare the penetration of an expanding or deforming bullet with that of a non-expanding or non-deforming bullet. Another factor in penetration is the basic aerodynamic shape of a bullet. A relatively sharply pointed bullet will penetrate further than a blunt tip bullet of the same caliber and design. While velocity is not an important factor in penetration, what about the relationship between velocity and the wounding effect? Will a higher velocity bullet create a larger wound? The, uh, the idea that velocity is invariably associated with big temporary cavities and therefore you must have a big temporary cavity in order to get a high in order to get a big temporary in other words you have to have a high velocity to get a big temporary cavity is is sort of contradicted by by the wound profile I'll, I'll show you here 
This is the, the Vetterly bullet. This was the uh, typical of the bullets used in military forces back in the oh, 1850s to 1870s. This Vetterly was used by the Swiss and the, uh, and the Italian armed forces, and it was the uh, bullet used by a, a fellow named Theodore Coker, who was a rather famous surgeon, did a lot of wound ballistic studies in Thun, Switzerland, and he used this, this bullet. I have a friend that has a Vetterly, and he brought that up here, and we did this study in my laboratory. And here it's a large lead bullet, and it mushrooms uh, very shortly after hitting. Now, it hits at 1,357 feet per second, which is relatively low velocity, not much faster than a 22 long rifle. But the temporary cavity it forms is about as big as that formed by the M16 or the Russian AK-74. You see, so, so uh, you really don't need high velocity alone. I mean, you, you cannot separate velocity from your other variables. You can take low velocity and high mass and get a big temporary cavity too, especially with a non-aerodynamic uh, bullet, which, which it forms by, by its mushrooming. Interestingly, there was a, uh, historically, an interesting thing associated with this, with this bullet, an interesting story. Uh, the, the velocity increase of the M16 over the 7.62 NATO, which it replaced, was about 10%. Now, if you look at the tables, it may be 12%, but in measured velocities in our laboratory, it's about 10% increase in velocity. And the marked uh, difference in, in wounding of the two was, had been attributed to high velocity. Right? Well, interestingly, when this bullet was replaced in, by military bullets, it was about the time that uh, the copper jacketed bullet was designed. And this, uh, was the, the copper jacketed bullet was designed because you couldn't shoot a lead bullet much faster than 14, 1500 feet per second because the lead would strip off into the rifling. So a copper jacketed bullet was designed. They called it a compound bullet for a while. Okay. The velocity increase was a 50% increase. These were about 1,300 feet per second. All of a sudden, our next generation was 2,000 feet per second. So here, here we're talking about a 50% increase. And you know what the effect was? The, the, everyone was complaining about the new bullets, whether they would have sufficient, uh, sufficient knockdown power or sufficient wounding power to be an effective military weapon because they would shoot through people and do very little damage compared to these. With an increase in velocity of 50%, a marked decrease in destructive effect. The, this is the, uh, the uh, Lee Metford that was used by the Brits over in, in India, which was not effective, and therefore they, they ground a little uh, a bit of the, the tip and made it a soft tip bullet. It became the dum-dum bullet, and then it became effective, you see, because they had to do something to modify the bullet because it w had such minimal wounding effect. And this is noted by many, many of, of uh, authors in the literature of the time. A fellow named Lagarde, the, you've heard the Thompson-Lagarde experiments. He was very famous and did a lot of work on, on military wounds also. He, in his book, uh, notes this. It's noted, everyone that looks at the subject notes this. We have a marked decrease in wounding, and we had a 50%. 50% increase in velocity, that's a lot. Of Another defective perception relating to bullet effectiveness is the concept of energy deposit in foot-pounds. Now, these are values given bullets when the bullet weight is multiplied by the velocity. The values are then expressed in foot-pounds of energy. To give you an example, a 357 Magnum traveling at about 1,300 feet per second is supposed to have the energy potential equal to the force you would need to raise 410 pounds one foot in the air. While some people, even some experts, think that because a bullet has 410 pounds or whatever of energy, that being hit with that bullet will be like being hit with a 410 pound weight. It's nonsense. In reality, most of the energy in that formula is converted to heat through friction when the bullet deforms and stops. The common method used to measure a bullet's kinetic energy is to shoot a bullet through a cadaver or pig muscle carefully measuring the bullet's velocity before it enters the target and immediately after it exits the target. 